Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's colloquium. Uh, Professor Chipman received his BS from MIT and MS from and PhD from the Optical Sciences Center at the University of Arizona, today the College of Optical Sciences. He is a fellow of the Optical Society of America and of the SPIE. In 2007, he received the SPIE's GG Stocks Award for Research in Polarimetry, and in 2015, the OSA honored him with the Joseph Frankhofer Award, Robert Berkeley Prize for Optical Engineering. Professor Schiffman received recently uh, or developed the Polaris and Polarization Ray Tracing Code, which analyzes optical systems with anisotropic materials, EO modulators, diffractive optical elements, polarized scatter light, and many other effects. It is really a, a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Russell Schiffman. He has been a colleague with us for many, many years, and uh, throughout these years, and from his uh, uh, education here at the college, uh, he is uh, very interested and dedicated to polarized light and its applications. We have, we have a wonderful colleague here, truly a scientist, and um, interested in the aspects of polarized light. With this, let us welcome Professor Schiffman in his talk. I think I have a mic, Jose. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Jose. It's uh, great to be here and um, to be talking about polarization, which um, I really seriously started studying when I was a, a graduate student here under Jim Wyant. I want to talk to you today about berry phase first and uh, the effect of berry phase on polarization and some odd things that um, I uncovered with uh, some graduate students, and uh, then about polarization effects on the point spread function. Um, but first, I want to acknowledge, first of all, the College of Optical Sciences for creating this uh, great environment that we have here. Um, two of my graduate students who contributed a lot to the work that I'm going to show, um, Garam Young, uh, who's now at Apple, and Tiffany Lam, who's at uh, Facebook uh, Oculus. I also want to thank uh, Utsunomiya University. They hosted me uh, for a year last year on my sabbatical, which uh, gave me some space to think about some of these uh, deeper questions about uh, polarization and image formation, where I work with Professor Yukitoshi Otani and Toyohiko Yatagai. And um, my students don't know it, but I have another graduate student hidden away um, in northern Japan, Suchandra Banerjee, who's working with me on um, berry phase. And then many, many other people who contributed to our um, polarization algorithms through their graduate, undergraduate research. I don't want to read all of their names, but I do want to um, credit these people that made substantial um, contributions to what I want to talk about today. And in outline, I want to show you a three-mirror system with some polarization rotation, and then take those concepts of polarization rotation into a lens example, and um, try to convince you that the point spread function in paraxial optics um, is not perfect. And then we'll talk about polarization aberration. We'll look at some examples uh, with the Cassegrain telescope and how the aluminum coatings or reflective coatings can degrade uh, the optical performance and some of the uh, effects that we anticipate um, that we're researching currently, particularly with regard to exoplanet coronagraphs. So let's all think about this example here where I have um, three mirrors and the polarization change um, that results. So picture you've got light here propagating in the Z direction, and then we reflect it into the Y direction, then we reflect it into the X direction, and then we reflect it back into the Z direction with mirror one, mirror two, and mirror three. And uh, if we come in here with this X polarization, it's going to be S polarized light, it's going to reflect this X polarized light, but then when we propagate into this um, X direction, that light is now going to flip here into the minus Z axis, it will be S polarized light again, and when it exits, it will have rotated by 90 degrees from the incident light. So you have to try this yourself. You bring it up, right, you bring it out, you bring it over, and then you bring it up, 
and you end up rotated by 90 degrees. There's no avoiding it. S polarized reflexes S polarized, P polarized reflexes P polarized, and we end up with this 90 degree rotation. And because there's three reflections, we also end up with a, uh, with a flip here. And if we look on a unit propagation sphere, you know, on this first segment, we're propagating in the Z direction, and then we're propagating in the X direction, in the Y direction, back to the Z direction again. And so we go from here to here to here to here. And this polarization rotation can be understood by the parallel transport of vectors on the surface of a sphere. By which I mean, I'm going to take one of these vectors, and I'm going to keep its angle with respect to this arc, and I'm going to bring it down to B. And then I'm going to keep its angle constant with respect to this arc, and bring it over to C, and keep its angle with respect to this arc constant, and bring it back to A. And if we watch what happens here, you can see that this vector, keeping its angle constant, now it's along this arc, but it curves around, and it's ended up rotated by 90 degrees. Or the other one similarly. Bring it around, bring it up, and it ends up rotated by 90 degrees. So we naturally get this polarization rotation as we change directions in optical systems. And we change directions in optical systems all the time. I mean, if we didn't change directions, that's just propagation. <laughs> there's no lenses, there's no focusing. So we have this um, effect, and we can calculate this effect um, by this parallel transport. And the amount of rotation that we got, in this case, is equal to 90 degrees, or pi over 2. And pi over 2, not coincidentally, is equal to the solid angle of this spherical triangle. It's 1 8 of the full sphere, 4 pi to radians. And so the rotation that we get in radians is equal to the solid angle that we trace out in stir radians. And we might have many mirrors or many ray segments going from lenses to lenses, but if we end up propagating in the same direction at the end, that's when this is simplest, the rotation will be equal to the solid angle between these um, vertices as we traverse the optical system. So now I want to look at a um, a lens example of this uh, Berry phase. Um, calculate the Berry phase and think about the point spread function. And what I want to convince you is that the you know, ideal point spread function we have for a circular pupil is an airy disk. But I hope that in 15 minutes, I can convince you that there's an extra term when I'm off axis. On axis, I think I'm going to see this point spread function. But off axis, I think I'm going to get a term equal to the derivative of this in paraxial optics. There's no higher order aberration here in this argument. So as we move off axis, I'm predicting that the left and the right circularly polarized components are going to shift in opposite directions. So on axis, I have an airy disk. Off axis, I have two airy disks, and the further off axis I go, these two airy disks shift. One of them is right circularly polarized, one of them is left circularly polarized, and they're going to shift in opposite directions with respect to the meridional plane. So if I'm moving up, these images are separating left and right. Okay? That's what I want to convince you. I want to get to the, the punchline here. And if I don't have linearly polarized light, if I have, I mean, circularly polarized light, if I have linearly polarized light, um, when we redo the problem, we're going to find that we get a term that's equal to the uh, first derivative when we look at the electric field of the airy disk as we go off axis. So in one case, with circular polarized light, I'm predicting I get these two airy disks. And if you combine those two eerie disks and look at what you have in linearly polarized light, I'm predicting that we'll get this derivative of the eerie disk included in our point spread function off axis, but not on axis. And it's a small effect, but we are trying to measure it at um, Utsunomiya University um, in Japan. We've got this set up with a polarimeter, and um, I hope to confirm this. 
because it was uh, really shocking to me when uh, Garam Yoon and I, now Garam Young, um, came up with this prediction. And the prediction is uh, based on the behavior of um, skew rays. So here I'm showing a lens and a fan of rays entering the lens. And this green ray is a meridional ray. And so it's in the plane containing the optical axis. And it just moves up and down in that plane. And here my red ray is a skew ray. And skew rays corkscrew around the optical axis in a single sense. So when my rays enter one side of the pupil, they're going to go around the optical axis clockwise. And the other side, they're going to go around counterclockwise. And in the meridional plane, they just go up and down, and there's no helicity. Everything is confined to one plane. And so for the example, we want an example like the example we had at the beginning, where our rays exit in the exact same direction that we entered and with like a magnification of one to make things simple. So here I have an object, and I have an intermediate image with a magnification of a minus one, and then a second image with an uh, image of one. So this is like a 4F and a second 4F system, and then my rays exit here parallel to my incident rays. And down here I show three rays uh, propagating through, and at each one of their refractions, these rays just fold and change their direction. They fold about the S component, and they just continue. Each interface, they fold about S. And we're not going to assume any Fresnel equations. We're just going to talk about the change of direction of these rays and the polarization folding and continuing in essentially the same polarization state, but in new directions. And so if we compose a, a skew ray here by adding together a chief ray and a marginal ray, um, we can construct a, a, a skew ray. And we have to add them in different planes. So if I take my chief ray here in this YZ plane, I take this marginal ray, we fold it 90 degrees, and then we add the two, then we'll get a skew ray that will go around the axis. And if we get over here, and we look down the axis, then our skew ray will start. It will propagate up to the first lens and refract to the second lens, to the third lens, to the fourth lens. And because we have a magnification of one, it will return to the same place that it started. Okay. So, and this we call a YY bar diagram. And this was something that I had to learn and study extensively when I was a graduate student here from Professor Shack, And so our polarization ellipses, here I have three ellipses, a marginal ray and two um, skew rays, one on either side. They're going through the system. And these ellipses are just folding. And then we're finally exiting out the other side. And um, so this, let me, I'll let them finish here. And um, then we'll look at them down the other direction. And we're following these rays through. And so if we look in um, the direction of propagation, my skew ray is starting with a propagation component in both x and y. This is skew ray. And then after the first lens, it's propagating with minus y, and then the second uh, lens, it refracts again, the third lens. And finally, we're looking in image space where we have the um, skew ray propagating in the same direction that it started. So this is just a small part of that sphere that we looked at before. This is the z-axis on my propagation sphere. And we're propagating here a little more than a tenth of a radian. So this is just a small part of that large propagation sphere. But again, we have an area here that subtends a solid angle on the um, propagation sphere. And we'll have a rotation due to this um, solid angle that we're subtending. So if we put in some numbers and we give ourselves a big attendu, 50 millimeter effective focal length lenses, 0.3 numerical aperture, object height of 30 millimeters, and work through the numbers, we're ending up in this system with a 0.09 steradian um, 
solid angle for this um, square cap on our sphere. This is about five degrees. So we're predicting that this skew ray from this object height through the edge of this pupil, that that skew ray will get a five degree rotation, whereas the meridional ray will have no rotation. And the skew ray on the other side of the pupil will have a rotation of minus five degrees. So we can send in a collimated beam here. So all of our linear polarization is aligned in one plane. And after going through this paraxial optical system, we'll have a collimated beam coming out. But because of this berry phase, we'll have no rotation for our meridional rays, but I have a five degree rotation at the edge of my pupil going through zero to a minus five degree rotation on the other side of my pupil. Okay. And now I want to think about what happens when this comes to focus. Because this should focus to an eerie disk, but this, well, it's not uniformly polarized. I have to diffract my Y component of the light and my X component of the light separately and then square their fields and add them to get the point spread function. And so we have a more complicated point spread function for this case than we have for the incident polarization. So our X thing polarization is not the same even though this is a paraxial optical system. And so again, the effect that we're talking about is this very phase but it's now in a small region here. And here we're looking through the optical system and I have a meridional ray and I have a skew ray on one side and a skew ray on the other side. And you can see the small angle that we have between these rays as they just fold and go through the optical system where they fold about the S component and the P component changes its angle, but the ellipse remains the same. Yes? You have a drawing there with some, I'm talking about some polarization ellipse. Um, I thought you said that uh, we're not considering the, that the light becomes elliptically polarized, or, or is it? We're not considering that the polarization change due to the Fresnel equations. So you can imagine that these lens interfaces are like perfectly anti-reflection coded so that my S and P for null coefficients are both one. And then my polarization is not changed. My S is transmitted, my P is transmitted. My, my ellipse has to change direction to remain transverse. Which ellipse? Well, whatever the incident polarization ellipse is. We're, we're choosing different states here. So we're talking in one case, we could illuminate with circularly polarized light. In another case, we're saying, we could illuminate with linearly polarized light. And here, for example, we're saying if we illuminate with linearly polarized light, then we predict this linear polarization in the exit pupil. So the effective effect of this very phase, and that's the second question, I don't know why we call it very phase, at the name of phase, but it's just like the effect of the attenuation just to change the orientation of the individual optical field. So you mentioned diattenuation, which we would get if our S and P for null coefficients are different, okay, as we go through the lens system. But we're assuming that our S and P for null coefficients here are the same. We're only talking about the effect of the change of direction. We're not talking about some... Uh, well, the effect is very similar to uh, it's a completely different cause, so I would say no. Well, we can rotate the plane of polarization with optical activity. We can rotate the plane of polarization with partial polarizers. We can rotate the plane of polarization um, with this berry phase and change of direction, but they're all different mechanisms, so. Well, I think when we look at the circular polarization, you'll get a sense. But it was named the Berry phase back in the 1970s. And it was first investigated in quantum mechanics, where 
quite a bit of literature on the Berry phase, and then I've been investigating the Berry phase in geometrical optics. So we're taking those concepts from quantum mechanics. Um, and uh, when I realized that this effect was present in paraxial optics, um, I, I literally fell out of my chair because I thought that I understood paraxial optics and that I would never see something new <laughs> in paraxial optics. I just, you know, I use paraxial optics all the time, you know, almost daily basis, but um, I did not anticipate this. Nobody ever showed it to me. So here is that K space, and you know, on one side of the pupil, we're propagating our skew ray this way around a rectangle. As we get to the meridional ray, the propagation vectors are all in one plane, and so this uh, sphere gets, uh, this uh, rectangle gets smaller, then it changes sign when we get to the other side of the pupil, and here we are all the way at the other side of the pupil. And so it's the area of these um, rectangles that we calculated for paraxial rays that um, account for the rotation for each one of these individual rays. And so if we look across the field of view of this paraxial optical system, on axis, uh, every ray is meridional. So there is none of this berry phase. It's only when I go off axis, I have these meridional rays that I get rotation across my pupil. And for a paraxial system, if I go twice as far off axis, now I've got twice as much rotation of the uh, linear polarization. If I go off axis in the x direction, these are the meridional rays. And so I have a rotation up here of an opposite sign of the rotation down here. If I'm 45 degrees in the field, these are the meridional rays, and the rotation is in this direction. So the rotation is always perpendicular to the meridional plane. So this is how it would appear across the field of view, and we would have none of this effect at the center of the field of view. So we have this rotation, and rotation is similar to optical activity or circular retardance, where on one side of the pupil, we've rotated clockwise. In the other side of the pupil, we've rotated counterclockwise. So if we look at um, right here and left circularly polarized light, if I send in right circularly polarized light, there's no rotation for this meridional plane, and that rotation increases in the clockwise sense over here and advances the phase, and on this side, it uh, retards the phase, and so I have a linear phase variation across my exit pupil from the changing Berry phase. No Berry phase rotation here, but a linear uh, variation of the phase in this direction. Well, my right circular polarized light is advanced over here. My left circular polarized light, if I move it to 1 o'clock, is retarded. And it's advanced over here. So I have the opposite linear phase shift for my left circular polarized light than I have for my right circular polarized light. So the um, Berry phase for these skew rays has put tilt into the right circular polarized wavefront, and it's put the opposite tilt into my left circular polarized wavefront. So it's very much like circular retardance, retarding one circular state with respect to the other. So if I have these opposite tilts, then I'm going to shift the point spread functions for these circular polarized components, or if we look at the linear polarization, this will turn into a derivative term. And so for circular polarized light, I'll shift right circular polarization one direction and left circular polarization the other direction, and my point spread function will become elongated. It's really made up of two overlapping point spread functions with different um, linear phase shifts. But we'll get this broadening perpendicular to the meridional plane. Yes? Uh, understand the very phase. And the way I can sort of conceptualize that is if I think of a phase distortion across the people, right, it's a linear distortion that would cause that to shift. 
Yeah. So for X or Y polarized, that is the phase profile, which is we refer to as berry phase. For X or Y polarization, we're getting a rotation. For circular polarization, it rotates, but it turns into a phase shift. And so these are two convenient bases to think of it in. But it's coming because my polarization ellipse is folding, and then it's folding about a different axis. And then it's folding about a different axis again um, when it's a skew ray. And we've spiraled that skew ray 360 degrees around the optical axis, and it's ended up rotated. And it's exactly simulated by that parallel transport of vectors on the sphere. It leads to the same answer, so that's a geometrical picture for it and a way to calculate it. And I expect this to be controversial. <laughs> I had to work really hard to convince myself, and I won't be 100% convinced until we have a measurement. So even I am, am a little bit skeptical here. Yep. Yeah. And so when we have linearly polarized light, um, if we go back to this figure here, if I look at the y component, the x component of this light, this has an x component to the left. This has no x component. This has an x component to the right. So if I put this through an x polarizer, I have something that's apodized like the function x. It's just linearly apodized from this side of the pupil to that side of the pupil. And if I have a circular aperture times the function x, and I Fourier transform it, and I ask lots of graduate students this question, and some of them know the answer, if you multiply a function by x and then Fourier transform it, you get the derivative of that function. And so in this case, the x component will Fourier transform into the first derivative of the Airy function in electric field. So my y component is nearly the Airy function. It's quadratically apodized. But my x component turns into this derivative of the um, Airy function. So if we now look at these components, and um, we would have our y polarization here be nearly a Airy function. And my x component, this is intensity, so we've squared it, is this square of the first derivative. And so the net point spread function in this direction is shown by this purple curve here. It has this derivative of the Airy function mixed in to the point spread function. It's no longer an ideal point spread function. And I just want to emphasize that everything here is still paraxial. I mean, it's more complicated with real rays and aberration theory, but these are things that are happening with paraxial rays. And if we put in 45 degree polarized light, then we get a point spread function here. We can represent um, with uh, these uh, polarization ellipses. And right down the middle of that point spread function, I have 45 degree polarized light. But when I go to one side of the point spread function, it becomes more and more elliptical. And on the other side of the point spread function, it has the opposite ellipticity. And so my right circular polarized light has been shifted to one side. My left circular polarized light has been shifted to the other side. You coherently combine them, and you get a point spread function that looks like this. And this is for 2 thirds of a wave of skew aberration, which is enormous. But I wanted to show a point spread function where you could really get a sense of what's happening. In a more realistic case, this would be um, changed much more slowly. So I want to compare this with retardance, which we're familiar with in wave plates. Retardance is a polarization dependent phase change. We get it from propagation through a wave plate, a birefringent material. We can get um, retardance from diffraction gratings. But it's an S and P phase difference 
in reflection or transmission, but it's an optical path difference. Retardance is an optical path difference. And here there is no optical path difference. These rays are taking the exact same path. The optical path length along every segment is exactly the same. There's no retardance. Excuse me. It's a geometrical transformation. And so we've named this kind of aberration skew aberration because it happens for our skew rays and it doesn't happen for our meridional rays. And it's strictly due to the changes in ray direction. And it appears like circular retardance or optical activity and that it changes the phase of right and left circular polarized light or it rotates linear polarization, but it's not associated with any optical path difference that I can see. And so the right and left circular polarized light have the same optical path length. So it's not retardance. It's not a retardance aberration. So to generalize this result, here I discussed a radially symmetric lens with a magnification of one just for simplicity to try to convince you of this complicated idea. But you get the same effect with mirrors. You get it in off-axis optical systems. You get a polarization rotation across the exit pupil, and it depends on the sequence of propagations for each individual ray. And here I showed you a linear rotation that's associated with paraxial optics, and it's typically down at the milliwave level. It's small, um, but real rays will also have higher order variations of their skew aberration as well. So the paraxial rays have a linear skew, but we can have quadratic, cubic, other components to the skew aberration. So this is how this generalizes, and you've just seen you know, the first piece of it. And so to conclude the discussion here of Berry phase, you know, paraxial optics is generally regarded as dealing as yielding ideal spherical wavefronts, and so it should yield an ideal point spread function. But we have this small polarization uh, rotation across the exit pupil in off-axis um, objects, and the cause of this rotation, which we're calling skew aberration, is related to the Berry phase and to parallel transport. And because of this rotation, we're getting additional cross-polarized components in the point spread function that are related to the derivative of the point spread function. And since these changes occur within paraxial optics, um, I find it really, really interesting. You know, that it goes all the way right down to the optical axis. So when we first were looking at the skew aberration, I thought it was just happening for you know, high order rays like Seidel aberrations, but um, it's not. And so this shows um, a polarimeter. We have at uh, Utsunomiya Daigaku, and um, we're setting up, you know, this is the polarization generator, and this is the polarization analyzer, and these can be taken apart and um, moved around. So we're creating um, point spread functions and um, looking for variations of circular retardance in the Mueller matrix point spread function as we're going to make a large point spread function, scan the analyzer around it, and measure the Mueller matrix across the point spread function, and look for this polarization rotation. And of course, we have a lot of confounding factors because there'll be wavefront aberration. There can be coating-induced polarization and stress. We have to calibrate the polarimeter to work at this level, and we want to get measurements at different fields of view to get a completely self-consistent picture to convince ourselves that we're really seeing this, um, uh, this skew aberration and this separation of the point spread function into the um, two components. No, we don't have perfect anti-reflection coatings. Yeah, we'll get a phase shift due to the Fresnel effect. Does that mean we shouldn't do the experiment? <laughs> um, if it's a lot larger than the Berry phase, then we're going to have a lot of trouble finding the Berry phase. And so we think that it will be smaller. And we can do a polarization ray trace. We have, and um, it should be considerably smaller. But um, it is something that I'm concerned about. I need to come back and convince you, you know, that I've actually measured this and, 
And again, we should all be skeptical. These are not easy experiments to do. And, um, but we don't give up just because lenses do have a little bit of retardance. Doesn't mean we don't try. So the effect of the anti the effect of the anti reflection coating first the retardance of anti reflection coatings is extremely small because the s and the p are so close to one you know the retardance that we have from anti reflection coatings you know are like tenths of a milliwave out to around 10 or 15 degrees and that retardance is radially oriented and its effect on the point spread function is easily calculated okay and it's different than the effect on the point spread function of an optical activity that varies linearly across the pupil. Something that varies quadratically from the center of the pupil and is radially oriented around the pupil. And I may be going over people's heads here because all of this goes back to my dissertation. Um, but you know, these are different effects in their form. They're different effects in their effect on their point spread function. And we don't want to give up the measurement just because there's other sources of retardance in the experiment. We want to isolate those and identify, if we can, you know, this separation of the point spread function into right and left circular polarized light along a particular axis where that separation is just a small fraction of the point spread function. I mean, we'll be looking for something like a hundredth of the point spread function, the area disk uh, radius. And so we're looking for a very small um, effect here. But um, as I said, this is um, in paraxial optics, and I just find it intrinsically interesting. And of course, when we do our real lens, it won't just be paraxial optics. You know, there'll be wavefront aberration and other things going on that we have to convince ourselves that we have seen this berry phase shift. Um, and I'm concerned that we won't succeed, but um, Suchandra Banerjee has her um, her PhD dissertation, you know, writing, and this is the big thing that she wants to uh, accomplish for her dissertation. So, and she has several years and funding from the Japanese government to do it, and some good equipment. So I think we can do it. This field of the optical field can be very easily confused with the effect of the, the attenuation, right? So the lenses have the attenuation, the S and P. Um, transmission coefficients are a little bit different, okay? Maybe out at the edge of the lens, it's like a almost a half a percent polarizer. And again, that's radially oriented. And that creates a point spread function in the cross polarization that has four islands. We'll see something like this coming up um, in the next section. But the effect on the point spread function is different, right? It's just like the effects of coma and um, Astigmatism on the point spread function are different. The effects of the diattenuation of an uncoated lens or a coated lens and the phase change from the um, coatings and the skew aberration, they all have different effects on the point spread function. So diattenuation does not make the point spread function look like this. It makes the point spread function rotate in the four diagonals and it's unrotated uh, down the middle, but it causes a rotation with a different symmetry. So we don't give up just because there's multiple things going on in the experiment. We, we want to really see this. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit about exoplanet coronagraphs. Um, NASA is developing um, instruments to image um, exoplanets and other solar systems so that we can get images and spectra and polarization measurements and understand their atmospheres and um, uh, look for signs of life or other facts. And if we look at the Earth from um, 10 parsecs away, you can see here Jupiter and Venus and the sun has been suppressed here as it would be suppressed in a coronagraph in the Earth. And these have brightnesses that are around 10 to the minus 10 um, of the sun. And they're within several airy disk diameters um, of the star for large telescopes. And so these systems are pushing the specifications for point spread functions. And so there has been a lot of interest 
in the effects of uh, lens and mirror and optical system diattenuation and retardance on the point spread functions and coronagraphs to ensure that these aberrations don't interfere with the um, uh, imaging goals and the specifications of these telescopes. So here you can see the contrast of a planet, and the Earth is here around 10 to the minus 10. Here's Venus, it's a little brighter, and Jupiter. And uh, here's the separation from a star. Um, again, this is at 20 parsecs now, so this is about 70 light years away. And um, the James Webb um, Space Telescope, which is about to uh, launch in two and a half years, will be able to see these existing um, exoplanets. These are bright exoplanets that are known, but it has nowhere near the uh, aperture um, and the resolution to see Jupiter or Venus, for example. Okay? So James Webb won't be able to image um, these uh, exoplanets, but W first, an instrument that's um, in phase B development right now, will be able to, if it meets its specifications, see Jupiter, almost be able to resolve Saturn or the Earth. And then later generations, there's a uh, concept called LUVOR, will be able to see Earth-like, Venus-like planets, you know, at that separation from a star um, 20 parsecs away. But to um, observe these exoplanets requires an exquisite point spread function. Okay? And so just to give you a few basics on polarization aberration, aberration is a deviation from ideal performance. And if I'm an optical designer, I want spherical waves. I want uniform amplitude. I want uniform polarization. And any deviation from that uniformity changes my point spread function, and it only makes it bigger. <laughs> it doesn't make it smaller. So when we have deviations from a spherical wavefront, those are our wavefront aberrations. But we can also have amplitude aberrations or apodization. They also increase the size of your point spread function. If you think of a Gaussian beam, it's larger than the equivalent circular aperture. And deviations from uniform polarization are called polarization aberrations. And I want to go through this very, very quickly, so I don't go into great detail here. Um, but I'm going to show you an example with an aluminum and then another example with an enhanced uh, reflective coating. And if we look at aluminum here, this is at 800 nanometers, the S uh, intensity reflectance increases, the P intensity reflectance decreases, and the difference between these two means that it's partially polarizing, and this is the diattenuation that we're referring to. There are different attenuations for the S and the P polarization, so an aluminum mirror is a weak polarizer, just at the few percent level out in these angles. Similarly, the uh, Incident light moves charges on the surface of the aluminum. Those charges re-radiate the light. That takes a certain amount of time, and there's a phase delay associated with the reflectance. That's 163 degrees, or just under um, pi radians here at normal incidence. And then the S-polarized phase delay decreases. The P-polarized phase increases, and this difference between these two is the retardance. Again, the retardance in these ranges is small, but it's not so small that we can ignore it in coronagraphs or microlithography or other applications. And I show here in particular at 45 degrees, you know, common angle for fold mirrors, I've got my P phase changing approximately linearly along this line, and my S phase is changing approximately linearly along this line, so I have different linear um, phase changes as well. So diattenuation we define as the maximum minus the minimum reflectance or transmittance divided by their sum. And so if we have equal um, transmissions or reflections, we have no diattenuation. And if we have a polarizer, T min goes to zero, and my diattenuation becomes one. So diattenuation tells me if unpolarized light is incident, what's the degree of polarization of the exiting light? 
Do I have a 1% polarizer? Do I have a 100% polarizer? And then retardance is my phase delay um, between two um, eigenpolarizations, which will have orthogonal polarization states. And so I get this optical path difference. And I get a small optical path difference when I reflect from aluminum, for example. And all of these can be described within the Jones calculus. So for a given array and an aluminum mirror, I can write a Jones matrix that will describe how an incident um, polarization state is related to the reflected polarization state. So the Jones matrices for the dieten contain the diattenuation and retardance and amplitude and phase changes. So here I have a Cassegrain telescope, relatively fast, with a 90 degree fold mirror. And we want to look at the point spread function for this Cassegrain telescope um, with aluminum coatings. And this is straight out of um, Tiffany Lamb's um, dissertation. Um, these just show some specifications for this particular fold mirror, which was evaluated at 800 nanometers, and this complex refractive index. And so my angles of incidence at my primary mirror and my secondary mirror would be zero at the center of the mirrors. Of course, there's an obscuration. And that angle of incidence increases approximately linearly towards the edge of the pupil on the primary and secondary. But at the fold mirror, we have angles of incidence varying from around 40 to 50 degrees, about the 45 degree um, central angle. And so we can take these equations and we can calculate what the diattenuation is for each ray. We can calculate what the retardance is for each ray. And we can calculate them for individual mirrors. We can calculate them end to end through the optical system. And so for the primary mirror, the diattenuation is very small. It's 3 tenths of a percent at the outside of the pupil and 4 tenths of a percent at the secondary. And then at the fold mirror, it's about 6 percent and end to end. We have this. So this is describing what kind of polarizer each of these ray paths is based on their position in the exit pupil. Most of it's coming from the fold mirror because it's at the largest angles. Similarly, we have retardance from that aluminum. And again, this retardance is increasing in magnitude quadratically. And it's radially oriented. It's about 009. These are in units of radians. And in radians, these can be directly compared. And then we have a certain retardance from the secondary mirror, a much larger retardance from the fold mirror. And so the telescope end to end has about 0.2 radians of retardance, increasing linearly. And there's some radial component across it. And this particular form of retardance, and this is on axis for this telescope, this particular form of retardance introduces astigmatism into the reflected beam. Because if I come into this mirror here with vertical polarized light, this is the fast axis of the retardance. So the phase is increased in this direction quadratically. But in this direction, that light is um, uh, S-polarized. And it's along the slow axis. And so the vertical polarized light phase is delayed in this axis. So if I'm quadratically changing the phase, advancing the phase in the y axis, and quadratically delaying the phase along the x axis, I'm getting astigmatism in linearly polarized light from a um, mirror on axis. And then if I rotate the plane of polarization, that astigmatism will rotate. So it's hard to see an unpolarized light because it's a different astigmatism for each component of the unpolarized light. But it does increase the point spread function for unpolarized light. So now all of this is uh, turned into Jones matrices. And so here we have the amplitude and the phase of the Jones matrices. So for example, if I view this system between two x-oriented polarizers, I have a nearly constant amplitude varies from about 0.82 to 0.83. Okay, just a small variation. And similarly, between two y-polarizers, 
where this is p-polarized light, so the reflectance is less, I vary from about 0.78 to 0.79. This is a very small apodization here between two Y polarizers. And when I cross those polarizers, I um, couple light in these parts of the pupil because of those retardances and diattenuations that I have rotating around the pupil. And it's a small amount in amplitude is here, it's around 0.016, but it's not zero. And it's highly apodized, which means that its Fourier transform is going to be much larger than something that's nearly uniform. So just looking at these amplitudes, this is pretty close to the identity matrix. If I have an identity matrix, some constant here, the same constant here, and zero and zero, that means I have no polarization change. I'm at some reflection loss, but if this is the identity matrix, there's no polarization change, there's no polarization aberration. But we do have some polarization differences, and so there is a small amount of diattenuation aberration that we see in here. And so this is close to the identity matrix, but it's not exactly the identity matrix. If we look at the phases, if I put in two X polarizers and I took an interferogram, and these are in radians, I would see the phase increasing across the pupil from the bottom to the top by a small number of radians, but the phase is increasing in this direction because of that fold mirror. I'm at smaller angles on the fold mirror here and larger angles at the fold mirror on this side of the pupil. But the interferogram between two Y polarizers is the opposite. The phase is decreasing from the top to the bottom. Plus we have some higher order. This is the astigmatism that I referred to before. You can see some astigmatism and some other aberrations present in this phase map. And so the interferogram due to the aluminum between two X polarizers and between two pol Y polarizers are slightly different. And if I'm running an adaptive optic system in a coronagraph to correct for the wavefront, well, I could correct this wavefront, but not this one, or vice versa, I could correct this wavefront, or not this one. I wouldn't be as concerned about these because they don't have very much power in them, okay, in those terms. And uh, you see these discontinuities here because we're going through zero here. The amplitude is zero along these axes through the pupil, and so the phase is jumping by pi across those boundaries. This is all on axis. Yeah, and the diattenuation and retardance, the angles of incidence will all change. And, and coronagraphs have really small fields of view, but other systems, like microlithography systems, we have very high at and do. So, yes. Um, and so just like the Berry phase that we had before, I have one linear phase variation across the, the pupil in this direction. I have a different linear phase variation in this direction. And we can see those linear phase variations here. These slopes are different. This means I'm going to separate my x and my y point spread functions slightly. So we have one tilt here. We have a different tilt here. And so the x and the y components of the point spread functions will shift with respect to each other. And that's a, of a lot of concern to us in the specifications for coronagraphs. So here you can see we have a small slope in S. We have a larger slope in P. We have a larger slope across this pupil, a smaller slope across this pupil. And now when we um, form an image, the um, X polarized light, part of it goes into X, part of it goes into Y because of this polarization coupling from the diattenuation and retardance. And so in intensity, my point spread function when X polarized light is incident will come from the Fourier transform of this squared will give me an intensity between two X polarizers. And this goes into an orthogonal component, X into Y. This gives me a different point spread function that I have to add to this point spread function. And then my Y polarized light goes into a third point spread function, and X, uh, X points, its X polarized light goes into a fourth component. So the point spread function is made up of four separate components. And the X incident light doesn't interfere with the Y incident light. It's coming from a star or a planet. And the X exiting light from X and the Y exiting light are orthogonal, so they do not produce um, intensity interference. 
And so we Fourier transform those four separately, and we get first an amplitude point spread function that we can express as a Jones matrix for x into x, the amplitude point spread function, y into y, okay? And these are slightly different than the airy disk because of the appetization and the um, wavefront aberration. And they're shifted with respect to each other. We can't see that at this scale. And then the cross polarizations have larger point spread functions because they're more appetized. They have higher spatial frequencies because they're more concentrated at the edges of the pupil. And they're dark down the middle because of the symmetry. And so we have two point spread functions that are nearly airy disks, and we have two that we like to call ghost point spread functions in orthogonal polarizations. And then we can convert that into a Mueller matrix. And so this tells me for incoherent light, like I would get from a planet or a star, for unpolarized light incident, the first column of the Mueller matrix tells you uh, what will occur. And so for unpolarized light, we have a nearly airy disk. And then we have a component here where horizontal is greater than vertical because of the differences in S and P reflectance from the primary mirror. And then in order of magnitude smaller than that, there's a small 45 degree component. And in order of magnitude smaller than that, there's even a circularly polarized component in the unpolarized point spread function. So if you moved around the unpolarized point spread function, you would measure these different components with a Stokes polarimeter. And you can put in here any arbitrary polarization. So if you happen to have linearly polarized light, then you would add these two columns and you would get a different um, Stokes distribution in your point spread function. And so these are of concern for exoplanet detection and polarimetry because we want a very high resolution compact point spread function. But we have this AXY and AYX Jones pupil components that are highly apodized. Also, we have these linear phase shifts, and these phase shifts are different. And so that affects the centroid detection that we would want to use in astrometry. And these linear phase shifts, well, they move images. And we're talking about small linear phase shifts, so we're talking about small motions of these images. And then these polarization variations themselves within the point spread function are going to complicate any planet polarimetry that we want to do to understand the aerosols and the compositions of these planetary atmospheres. So here I just show the two components of the point spread function, xx, normalized to 1, and the ghost point spread function of x into y, which is down here at 10 to the minus 5. And you remember, we're trying to find planets at 10 to the minus 10. And so here you see my nearly airy disk for my x into x, and my ghost polarization is down here around 10 to the minus 5. And its peak of light is near this first um, dark ring in the airy disk. And so we have this weak, but not that weak, in terms of exoplanet, contribution in this example from aluminum coatings. And if we look at the x into x point spread function and the y into y point spread function, one is a little bit weaker because of the diattenuation of the fold mirror. And they're shifted with respect to each other. Um, in this particular um, telescope, they're shifted by uh, 0.6 milli arc seconds. Or if you subtract them to measure the S1 component of the point spread function, if you shift two Gaussians and subtract them, the new centroid is shifted by a much larger amount. And so the S1 component of this image is actually shifted by almost an order of magnitude more than the shift between the two um, point spread functions themselves. So I'm going to show you one last example. I'm going to show you some extreme coding effects on an off-axis telescope. So that one was on axis. Here I've got an off-axis fast primary, secondary, and fold mirror. And I'm going to use an enhanced reflection um, coating here that has uh, four layers and is optimized for around 440 nanometers. So this is 100% reflectance. So we've boosted the reflectance of aluminum from 92% to up over 98% but we only get that 98% reflectance over a rather small um, wavelength range. So I could get more reflection 
but I only get it over a small range. And then I get minima when the um, uh, quarter wave layers become a half a wave or three quarters of a wave. So we have this oscillating uh, reflectance. And um, this shows the reflectance at 45 degrees. And now the S and P have separated from each other. And at 45 degrees, I have very different S and P phases. And this is what we would call the unwrapped phase. So you could unwrap, the, I mean, this is the wrapped phase from minus pi to pi. So these discontinuities actually are, it just keeps going up and up and up. But the arctangent function returns it within one branch. So here we're scanning in wavelengths. So here you can see the wavelength coming here from 400, 350 to 400 to 450 to 500 nanometers. And you can see this Jones pupil, which is nearly the um, identity matrix with some small off diagonal components. Here you can see the phases in the exit pupil and the phase is jumping rapidly. I apologize for that, but um, that's how it is. But you can see the uh, aberrations there in those phases again. And so at some wavelengths, we have small amount of polarization aberration at the um, peak of this reflectance. And then we get large amounts of polarization aberration when we move through these ranges where there's very rapid um, phase variations and large amounts of polarization aberration. And so now we can take this system with this coating on three mirrors and we can calculate the point spread function again as we scan here in wavelength. And because of these linear phases across the exit pupil, you can see as a function of wavelength what we would normally call lateral chromatic aberration, which is that the different wavelengths are reflecting off of these mirrors with different linear phase shifts. And we found a coating here where this example is really large. And so as we're changing wavelength, those linear phases are moving these point spread functions around and uh, aberrating them. You can see the amount of light here in the cross polarization. And so this coding is great for this small wavelength range. But when we get out of this wavelength range, we've got all kinds of polarization aberration going on. And so this is the kind of thing um, that, we can, that we can see. So in conclusion, ray paths through optical systems cause small very phase polarization rotations that we call skew aberrations. And these are present even in paraxial optics. And then the codings on the optics add additional polarization aberration in terms of um, diattenuation and retardance aberrations. And when the phase shifts are large, well, we can even make the point spread function dance. So thank you very much. And I just want to mention in the fall, um, we have polarization and optical design, optics 586. So you can learn all about this. You can use our Polaris M polarization ray tracing code and learn many, many more polarization effects that we have in optical systems. So I hope I see some of you in the fall. All right, so thank you very much.